Hello, everyone, and good afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us during your lunch hour uh, for this great event um, on this Women's International uh, Women's Day. We are so excited to have you here today for a lively conversation about housing in our community and how all of our efforts can come together to help women in our community um, embark upon the important, important mission of gaining housing for themselves um, and their families. So um, we're just going to start off with a few introductions. My name is Terea Hudson and I'll be your moderator today. Um, I am a PhD student at Drexel University and very interested in issues around diversity and inclusion. Um, I do a lot of volunteer work, have volunteered with Habitat, um, and just am really excited for the lively conversation that we're going to have here today. So I am going to turn it over to uh, Ms. Shaneria Ashley. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Well, I just want to say thank you to Habitat and Ellen for including Truist in this very important conversation. Less than a year ago, we created Truist. That's when SunTrust Bank and BB&T Bank merged to become the sixth largest commercial bank. Our purpose is to inspire and build better lives and communities. We serve 12 million households, a full range of business clients and community partners. But here at Truist, community is far more than your neighborhood, your town, your city or state. Community means fellowship, common culture, shared goals. Community is home for us. So consistent with our mission to inspire and build better lives in community, we wanted to uphold the spirit of community reinvestment by committing to investing over $60 billion across three years within our footprint. This is year two. And the plan was drafted in cooperation with community-based organizations, leaders within our footprint. We wanted to hear the needs, where they were, and how we can work together to address them. So through conversations with our Truist Community Advisory Board, we'll execute on this and we'll make sure that all the issues that come to surface, we have community partners where we can work together to address them. So I'll be remiss if I didn't say happy International Women's Day. And in the spirit of celebrating outstanding women, I would like to celebrate our Chief Inclusion Diversity Officer for Truist, Wendy McSweeney. In her role, she oversees the strategic direction, development, execution of the company's inclusion and diversity policies, making sure we have programs um, to advance the business, enrich our communities, and contribute to the overall performance of Truist. Today, I'm going to join the panel with a community CRA perspective. So at a high level, I'll share with you the investments that we have, the strategies that we have in place, to really support the LMI community, the low to moderate community. So I am so excited to be here. I look forward to having a great discussion with all of my illustrious co-panelists. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shanaria. And we will move next to Rebecca Kane. Hi, I'm Rebecca Kane. I am the CEO of Habitat for Humanity in Montgomery and Delaware counties. Um, we have been serving this community for over 30, we're in our 32nd year uh, this year. Um, we have a number of programs beyond home building. Most people know uh, about swinging a hammer for Habitat, bringing a group out and uh, getting together. But a few years ago, we realized that the issue of uh, sustainable housing also dovetails into uh, community uh, revitalization, neighborhood revitalization, um, and there was a big gap in, in financial literacy uh, amongst our applicants. Um, we had so many applicants that weren't in a position uh, to take on a mortgage, and with a little bit of repair and coaching, we realized um, that maybe uh, we could help more people get there, whether through our program with home building or even for uh, conventional uh, mortgages through um, Shenaria's program over at B and B or Truist now, um, which is exciting uh, what's happening over there. Um, but we're joining here today because uh, Habitat is celebrating, Habitat International, Habitats all over the country are celebrating uh, International Women's Day. And we want to shed a light on the need for affordable housing. We also uh, with uh, some surveys and some early results, we're realizing that this pandemic has exponentially affected women 
and uh, their ability to uh, maintain employment and, and, and to take care of their families. And, and women, again, are feeling the brunt of when things go down, they go down even further for women. Um, so uh, we want to uh, just highlight a little bit about um, the fact that right here at home, 80% uh, of the families that Habitat is currently serving are headed by female head of households. And 90% um, of our financial literacy course, uh, which is called Almost Home Graduates, are women. So women are stepping up and doing uh, what they need to do in order to take care of their families. And we're here to help provide that service. Um, but we need more partnership, we need more discussion and to get down to the root of uh, making some change so that uh, we build upon um, the successes that we've had. So I'm thrilled to be here, thrilled with my uh, illustrious panelists and uh, happy to highlight some of the things that we're doing and send an invitation out to all of you that are joining us uh, to knock on our door and we're here, we'll put you to work and, uh, and we want to make sure that uh, locally uh, we're caring for each other um, step, you know, hand in hand. It's wonderful, Rebecca. Thank you so much. And finally, we have uh, Vicki Landers. Hi, everyone. I'm Vicki Landers. Um, I'm the founder and CEO of Visibility Pride PA. Uh, we are an organization that promotes uh, more visibility, and we cultivate the pride felt within our community as, as, as of course, we advocate for a more inclusive world. Um, some of the things that we do um, are, you know, of course, we have fun events that are that are all accessible and inclusive. Uh, but we also uh, we're having hard conversations with our community about how to um, become homeowners, um, have have these conversations around finances, what things are out there for them, so that they could have the vision of wanting to um, own their own home. Um, these are things that aren't always brought up in our community, and these are things that I'm trying to um, really play a part in lifting the communication um, and, and trying to get more information out there. Um, because there are programs out there. Um, they're, they're not easy to find. And sometimes, you know, when in, in our community, we feel like um, it's just not going to happen for us, so we don't even look. So I'm trying to pull those resources together so people know that you can, it is something that can happen. You know, you know, our vision is, it, it, is that we, you know, we imagine a world where every disabled person feels pride, you know, that being a homeowner, having something that is yours that you get to take care of and, and, and to, you know, um, something that nobody can take away from you. Those kind of things are just, those are, those make you feel proud of yourself. And those are things that we want for our community. Um, you know, we, we are a, a, we are a big community out there. Um, people don't seem to realize is that the disability population includes seniors and disabled vets um, is well over 26% of the population. Um, and it, I'm so I'm so proud that in PA um, that you know women outrank men not by a huge percent but by 51 percent um, and that means that there are tons of disabled women out there. A lot of our disabled women are homeowners. Um, that's a huge percent of what we do. You know what we are. Um, it is something that we are. Um, we need to talk about more. I need to partner with the people here on this panel so we can figure out how to make this information more, you know, to get this information out to people. Um, you know, I'm a huge, I'm a huge advocate for women's rights, of course. Um, this being International Women's Day, you know, I am um, on, the, on the organizing committee for the Women's March on Philadelphia. Housing was always something that we talked about. Um, so I am, I'm constantly in the community trying to talk about how we need to become homeowners. It's something that I am looking at trying to do in the next two years. So I'm super excited about this conversation. 
And I hope everybody gets a lot out of it. Wonderful. Well, thank you all so much. And I am so excited to be here with you all and have this conversation. Um, you all are amazing and doing amazing work. So I'm really excited to, to start asking some questions. So uh, Rebecca, we will start with you. So you shared some really interesting statistics in your, your introduction. 80% um, of, of families served uh, by Habitat have a woman as the head of household. Why is that something that we should be thinking about in our communities as you know, volunteers, as nonprofits? Why is that something we should be thinking about? Oh, I think you're on mute. I had to be the first one to do that, just so you know, like, cause this is my first Zoom call, right? This is the first time I've done anything like this. Um, no, I, I think that, that, that the understanding that um, 80% of the women that are seeking help, right? Most of those women also have children. So housing then becomes essential for, um, you know, it's not just them. There's children, there's schooling. You think of all of the, all of the uh, parental duties that fall into place. And then it becomes that we're not just talking to a potential homeowner about here's your house, but then we're considering the school districts, we're considering transportation, we're considering all of these things um, that go along uh, with, with having and raising a successful family um, and providing a home for that family. Um, I think there's also an, an issue um, about the state of women in the world and what, you know, uh, it's a completely different experience for women. You know, I know my mother was, uh, didn't go to college and she was a stay-at-home mom for her entire life. And, um, very happily married for 50 some odd years. And, you know, it, it was a different experience. Um, I know I tell my daughter, that's not an option for you today. You know, the, you, you absolutely are going to have to develop yourself in a way that you can provide an income for yourself. And so I feel like the opportunities for women um, and how there's differences in education and, and as you come up, um, and then you're, you're saddled then with raising your families on your own and, and accountability. Um, and maybe in the lending uh, realm as well, uh, you know, there's, there's different obstacles that you come up against and, and uh, ways to balance it all. And if this pandemic has shown us anything, it's that professional women I know all of a sudden became the primary teachers and cooks and uh, managing every bit of the household uh, in, in addition to trying to balance a full-time job. And we've seen such a, a fallout in, in the women's workforce in the last few, um, few months. Um, and, and the recovery is going to be long from that. I think how we support each other um, when these things happen is the conversation that we need to have. And so the intersection of banking and, and the disability community and what they're doing, uh, the more we can, we can reach out to partners and, and come up with a better safety net for women and, and talk specifically about how we can help uh, women who are in these different situations is what's going to um, help us build back a little bit better uh, for when the next fallout happens. Thank you so much, Rebecca. So Shanaria, we actually heard uh, Rebecca talk about the state of women in the world and differences in education and some of the obstacles that they may face um, as they're looking for housing, as they're trying to balance it all. So can you tell me a little bit more about how Truist uh, approaches these issues and how we as a community can, can maybe be more helpful in supporting women as they're embarking on this journey of home ownership? Absolutely, and I just think that's a great question. And I love how she said, "When, not if, the next thing happens," because it's not—it's not a. <laughs> I don't think we can avoid change. Um, we can't avoid um, things happening, but when they happen, women are always the ones that roll up their sleeve and step up to the plate and just make it happen. And that's something that's just powerful. And you know, and I'll just share share personally that you know, today I am a community development manager. But even before that, and probably my most proudest occupation is being mom to Sierra and Simone Ashley. 
so I was a single parent and many, many moves ago, organizations like Habitat allowed me to be able to say, okay, babies, this is our home. And, you know, that may seem like just a light statement, but to be able to show my girls, wow, look what mommy did. She worked, she went to housing counseling. There were individuals that work with her. She understood how to do budgeting a little better. And to have a home, that, that's, that's just, I mean, that's planting seeds for future success. So I can tell you that, you know, I'm proud to work for an organization where the mission is to inspire and build better lives and communities. It has nothing to do with revenue, bank account, loan. Um, it has to do with building communities. And we do that with what I think, you know, when we talk about affordable housing, there's three things. There's the investment. So the corporation or organization, there has to be some type of an investment because we talk about access to capital for small business owners, but access to capital in the low to moderate community are specifically in some of the households that we're speaking to, that's an issue. You know, finding money to be able to have a down payment or finding money to be able to stay in the home because things will happen. I, I love when you said when, because they do happen. You know, how can we support from an investment standpoint? The other thing is the education piece. Um, I've worked for um, this organization for 15 years and started as a teller. And I'll be the first to say that I it was nothing to do with the organization, but I just didn't know how to start. Like it was overwhelming trying to figure out how to sign my name to the largest debt of my life. And so when we think about education, what type of resources do we have to educate individuals around the home buyer process? Um, are we doing that through the lens of empathy to be able to say, okay, I know we're gonna have to have this class at seven because you're working nine mm -hmm. to five, you have to pick up the children, there needs to be some type of new, a nutritious dinner and then be able to sit and get the information. And I think the last thing would be relevant products. So if you have the investment, you're educating the individual, then what products are available that say, you know what, 97% um, uh, down payment, or maybe we just need this amount of closing cost assistance. I think that the three of those things is really what helps support home ownership. And I can tell you, you know, to answer your question the long way, at Truist, we do invest and we do have education where we partner with organizations like Habitat and provide first time home fire training. We also do budgeting through crisis, credit one-on-one. We even have a business module for some of our women business owners or any business owner for that matter that wants to learn how to do businesses. And then we have relevant products. We have a community mortgage specialist in some of our key markets that specifically works with low to moderate income families to hold their hand through the process to make sure that they're able to achieve home ownership. That is wonderful to hear. Um, so Vicki, let's talk a little bit to you. Um, so we, we heard uh, some things about, you know, how women are powerful and how they make things happen and how they make these changes. You know, we heard you talk about how intersectional the disability community is, right? There's so many identities there. So where are we as a community falling short as far as supporting the disability community um, in getting housing? And you talked a little bit about it being difficult to find resources. What can we do differently as community um, organizations that are working together to make that a little easier? Well, that's a great question. Thank you. Um, I have to say that uh, resources, there's, um, they're really, they, they are not easy to find. Um, and we are actually in the process of building a resource page on our website. So that way we can start to reach out to Truist and Habitat for Humanity and ask them to give us resources so we can put them out there. You know, we, we are, we are um, a community um, serving all of Pennsylvania. Um, so we are trying to come up with resources for people all over the state. You know, I the state, um, you know, I, I, you know, the, a majority of disabled population, you know, 79% um, of us live in single family homes, but unfortunately, a huge percent of those homes are not accessible. Comfortable and feel independent in. And that's one of the biggest things that I find 
um, is, is the affordable, people always talk about affordable housing, but they don't talk about it as accessible. You know, there are still place that they're in place. There are things that say, well, if you build this new building of apartments that this teeny little percent of, just, of them have to be accessible. Well, what if we thought about building all of them as accessible? Because I will tell you that my friends who are not disabled don't even realize that my apartment is accessible. They don't see the difference. I do because I get to walk into my apartment every day and know that I can be independent. What if we built that way? What if we thought about when giving money to these organizations, these companies that are building, telling them that, that you know, they need to be more accessible. They, that, that, that little tiny percentage of what they have to do isn't enough. Um, you know, I tell people all the time that there are too many people living in institutions of our, our disabled population that are living in institutions. Do you know why? Because there's not accessible housing out there for them to be out in, in the community with just a little of assistance that they need, but they can't get out there because there's no housing for them. That's where we're, we're falling behind. That is a, a very painful reality. Um, and I think it is something we need to be thinking about. And, and I appreciate your, your candor and sharing that with us because so many times we don't think about the intersections of, of people's uh, identities, right? And so there, there are so many things that, um, that just fall by the wayside that we don't consider. So I really appreciate you sharing that. Um, Shneria, yeah. I'm going um, I'm going to transfer it back to you. Um, so how do you think, you know, just kind of given um, some of what Vicki said, how do you think that we can be thinking together about um, the intersections of, of people's identities and how that affects housing? You know, we know about practices like redlining and, and things like that, but just hearing Vicki's perspective about housing not being accessible, um, what are your thoughts about how we can move this conversation forward? No, thank you for that question. And, and Vicki, I just got chills hearing you speak because um, it took me to a place where um, I have a cousin who is a graduate of Gallaudet University. And I think that at a young age, it was an eye opener for me that there are many different ways that people have to learn how to communicate. And if we miss that, we are not giving all audience an opportunity to just do normal things, like just communicate and, and feel like they're comfortable or they have a means to um, be vocal and advocate for themselves. So, you know, I, I definitely understand. And I can tell you that you know, yes, we have invested, but we also have invested in the core strategy. You know, when you think about an issue or you think about progress or you think about moving from one place to another, if the internal infrastructure isn't correct, you're not gonna be able to have the goal that you want on the outside. So internally, I'll tell you that part of that community benefits plan was a diversity staff commitment. And this is why that's important. We have to employ a diverse workforce to meet the financial services of our clients and community. And diversity isn't always about race. Um, and so that's why here at Truist, we have business research groups that are on all spectrums. Um, we have a CAN network, and it's a capability action network that speaks to our associates that can. We don't say they can or disabled. We said they absolutely can do it. And CAN is one of six business research groups that we have at Truist. And within these internal business research groups, it's external and it's internal. We make sure that we have oversight over some of the products and processes and always love to get more information and learn from one another. Um, this past month, we celebrated with the Bold Group. That's the Black Organizers, Leaders, and Doers. So for Black History Month, we had an opportunity to learn about Black history. We had an opportunity to re-engage um, just to have an opportunity to have safe places to have conversation. And I'll just say that, you know, I'm really proud of the organization because when everything was going on last year with the social injustice and the George Floyd cases, 
um, we had open listening sessions where our senior level executives, I mean, they were on multiple calls just to hear and learn. So I think to answer your question is we have to be able to hear, understand, and learn. Um, I can tell you that, you know, affordable housing is only one of the four pillars that we support through our given strategy. We also look for essential community services, which is really important. Um, small business access to capital, workforce development. So those four things together is how we hope not to have any blind spots. You know, so that we're touching all the different types of communities. We're learning from our community leaders and partners so that we're not siloed to thinking that this is the only way we can have change. So I think our internal strategies and our external investments is really going to help us um, to, to be able to have that change in conversations like this, to be honest with you. So really just thankful again for Habitat for um, having this conversation because I'm definitely taking down notes um, as far as questions um, when we're looking at investments for our affordable housing partners. That is wonderful. And then, um, you know, Shanari, I, I love the idea how you touched upon safety, right? And, and there's so much going on in our world right now. Your home is, is the place that you want to feel safe and embraced and that that, that world um, might not necessarily be able to come inside. Um, so that's so important. Um, so in thinking about kind of safety and making sure that, you know, um, everyone kind of has that sense. Uh, Rebecca, can you talk a little bit about women's build and why that's an important factor um, in creating that safety for, for women in our community who, you know, are looking for home ownership? Yeah, I, I would say, obviously, we've learned through this pandemic that home is everything and, and that the, it's, it's not just where you make dinner, it, it, it's everything. It holds up your family. It's been a, a, your home has to raise and meet you, but it goes beyond that into where your home is located and where your neighborhood is. And do you feel part of that community? Do you have a voice in that community? And so one of the um, other programs in, in listening to you, Vicki, I, I just wanted to kind of like, oh, wait, we have a program for that. But um, <laughs> because we do do, a, a critical home repair program where we make modifications to owner-occupied housing in order to accommodate uh, physical disabilities. Um, you know, we'll, we'll, it's it's a prioritized program for uh, veterans, seniors, and people with disabilities specifically. And um, we are constantly uh, searching for resources. We do these uh, repairs at a sliding scale. Most people. You know, they get a roof and it's a, it's a pay what you can afford uh, sliding scale, but, um, you know, most people get a roof for, you know, less than $500. Um, and, and it's more about the partnership working with us and then also us finding other avenues for you in your home to become an advocate or a leader on your block and in your community for good. So you can address the quality of life issues um, that uh, exist in your neighborhood. And if there's room for improvement to those quality of life um, aspects, uh, we, we love our partners to feel empowered uh, to take on that role. Um, so I, I think that, you know, as we, as we try to tackle um, some of the, the social injustice and all of this other stuff, it's really about getting out and seeing who's Who's next to us? Who's my next door neighbor? Who's the person that I can reach out and, and show some grace to and get to know and, and really take on listening and, um, and finding ways for us to empower one another. I mean, we need banking partners. I, I ask the bank for money so that I can do my programs so that I can help Vicky's people. Like it's all interwoven, it's all threaded together. And the more candid, conversations we have so that power, you know, between the banks with the resources and us to do the work and her to get the, the her people to have the benefit and then have the feedback and then help the community, it's, it's also interwoven. And the more conversations that we have with each other, and, and I'm so thrilled about the work that you're doing at the bank level to, to start those listening groups and to have that action and, and to, you know, it not you know, there's an impression that it's all about the bottom line and, and the investors and, and not really about the community, but um, 
this talk gives me hope that, that there's, um, you know, a, a settling of competition and a refocus. And maybe that's the best thing we take away from the pandemic is a refocus on our neighbors and doing good for one another. And then that's my Pollyanna take on that. <laughs> That's great, Rebecca. And I just want to kind of piggyback on your point about having a voice in your community and making sure that, you know, you're, you're feeling supported. And, and Vicki, I, I love um, kind of, I'd love to hear your thoughts about, you know, how can we as organizations, as community members um, advocate, advocate for others? Um, what are some strategies that we can use as we're learning more about some of the issues that are happening in our communities um, to make sure that all of our neighbors have a voice and are getting what they need. Um, well, one of the simple, one of the easiest things for me is that you need to make sure that um, that disabled people are coming to the table and having having a voice. Um, you know, I hear lots of conversation now about diversity, equity, and inclusion. Most of the time that doesn't include disability, um, which is a huge issue. Um, so we're asking that we're that that you ask us to the table, but also listen to us while we're there. Um, that we are, we we do know what is going on in our community. Um, we what we're what we work towards is an inclusive world where everybody can live together. And some of the things that we're talking about, like universal design, you know, makes it so that if you, you if you if you built an apartment building, were all done with universal design, so they were accessible from the from the start, and you could have twenty different types of you know different people. You could have. Sorry, <laughs> you can have 20 different people come in and live there with and without disabilities of all genders, races and everything. And we all just live together independently, but together, um, it's a huge thing. People are always talking about building uh, accessible housing, you know, um, but it, a lot of the times it comes down to where they're building. Here you are, here's, here's, this property where we're going to shove all of you together, you know, instead of just integrating the community um, so that we're all getting, you know, we're all feeling like we matter. And I think that's the biggest point um, is making sure that that people are being heard. I, I, my community or well, my organization is always looking to partner with other organizations to have conversations. I can get the community there. I need people who want to actually speak to the community and have something to, to show the community that they're looking, you know, that they're actually thinking about them when they're doing something. Wow, that's that's very powerful. I think the idea of, of just building housing for everyone, it, it seems like such a simple concept that, you know, we should just build housing and apartment buildings so that they're accessible to everyone. I mean, it just, it boggles the mind sometimes how this, we make simple things so much more complicated. Um, but just in our, our last few minutes of, of our talk, and this has been a tremendous discussion, I've learned so much and I've been jotting down notes that I can take back. So I'm looking forward to, to kind of seeing how, um, how we can put this all into action, but I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, empowerment, specifically the empowerment of women. Um, it's International Women's Day. Um, so Maria, let's talk a little bit about empowerment. As we kind of wrap things up, what are your thoughts about empowering women, um, empowering women in different communities and specifically um, in moderate to low income, making sure that they feel heard and, um, safe and, and, and powerful? No, that, that's a great question. And I will just say that our, our WIN business resource group, so it's W-I-N, Women's Informa Information Network, is um, kind of on the spotlight this month celebrating Women's History Month, and they're doing a phenomenal job. Um, we have about maybe 
10 to 15 internal sessions where teammates can take their lunch hour or spend some time after work and just have conversations about mental health, have conversations. Um, I joined the conversation. Uh, it was Slay Like a Mother, and please forgive me. I don't have the author's name, but if you Google this book, let me tell you, everything that you carry on your shoulders and back, you can kind of just relax because you realize that you're not alone. So I think when we think about empowerment, the word power invested in that is really the power of the word. When we realize that our potential and everything we need is inside of us, I think that's what helps us get to the next level. But then you need a community. You need a network. You need people. You need to sit down and have conversations with Vicky's and Rebecca's and see where, where their struggles are or where their gaps are. And if you have them, fill them. Um, to Rebecca's point, you know, let's start to have conversations Let's start to see how we can support one another. If we're not the individual that can do it, pass it on. I think some of my um, lowest days, because we have them, every day is not sunshine. Um, how I've moved past that personally is thinking about someone else, like giving service to someone else. So I think that when we're able to do that, it gives us power, but then pass that along. You know, um, when you're doing something for someone in the community, if you give them the gift of how to be a servant leader for someone else, that's how we triple that hope of that. And it just multiplies and multiplies and multiplies. So um, as a woman, I personally believe I have a superpower and that allow me to tell them that I'm going to tell them that and tell them to tell someone else that. But then to my fellow executives, that's working alongside with me, that's on their fifth Zoom for the day. Before the call ends, I'm gonna stop and say, how are you doing today? And just mean it, not just how you doing, I hope you're well. No, how are you doing today? No, how can I make your day better? And I think that's how we empower one another. And it's very small, but it's something that we've missed throughout the years and centuries. There's the, the authenticity of interaction. Social media has kind of taken that away because you can kind of touch and go. Well, we need that touch now, I think more than ever. And having a moment to stop and listen, because I heard Vicky today, you know, now I'm challenging some of my strategies or some of the way that I look at some things personally, not, you know, as an organization, orga organization does a wonderful job, but I think stopping and really listening is how we're going to keep that power going. I would like to say something at this point, and I'm really apologize. My name is Kim Lawson. I end up having overlapping on a couple of calls. Um, my background is in architecture and buildings. I got uh, civic duties and things that I'm totally involved with. And uh, to piggyback on what you said, a lot of times what we don't understand as women, what uh, a lot of uh, our emotional selves, our passionate selves, that people have constantly thrown at us as a problem, that is our source. That is what we put out there and that is what moves us. And that is also what attracts other people. When they see the passion, and I notice when I get involved in a lot of my civic duties or anything that I do, people get the passion that we give emotionally. And as moms, as women, we have that. And that ignites so much in people and they want to know, they want to do, they want to get involved in. And I find that out to be a very big tool because they hear it in my voice and my heart is revealed because when we get into something, we get into something. And yeah, right now, and I'm working on so many things right now with the COVID uh, education and scholarships and all these things, but it's that passion that leads and it's that passion and emotion that is magnetic. And it just draws people. So we got to learn to use that which we have innately to push us forward and to pull everybody else towards us. Because it is, it is a power and people will listen, you know, and it comes out in so many ways in Amaya Angelou and, and so many people and our best actresses in a Cicely Tyson, you know, and, uh, you know, just uh, um, Andrea Lawful Saunders. These are people I listen to. And, and the reason why they people follow them, they hear that passion. They hear that power. And with our own voices and our own innate ability as women, we can move that and we do have that because, you know, just like that saying behind every great man, there's a great woman. And it was because of her passion, her power and her innate ability to move people naturally. That's who we are. And we need to understand that and use that to our best abilities and to do what we all need to do as a people, as a person, as a world, a nation, however you want to push that ring out. Absolutely. I think it's so important. I love that that idea of power. Um, and, and Vicki, if you could just kind of um, piggyback on that, 
talk to us about empowerment. What, as we kind of wrap this up, what, what are your thoughts about empowerment? How can we empower others? Um, what is it that um, we all need as far as empowerment, especially as women? I think that one of the, to me, the, the, the greatest things is that we need to listen to each other um, and, and, and come together. Um, like my friends uh, at the Women's March in Philadelphia, it, you know, we, we came together, we saw a need, we came together, we raised our voices and it was heard. Um, that's the thing that I think we need to do on a daily basis. We need to start listening to each other because a lot of times um, there's too much chatter on top of each other. Um, and I think that um, getting together with more conversations, more just casual chats with women like this that we had today, you know, I think it really helps to bring women empowerment together. You know, it helps us to, to uh, for me, I know my voice, but it helps others to raise their voices, to let them know that they're allowed to raise their voice. I'm always very loud. People <laughs> usually hear me whether they want to or not. So, um, but I think that this is just, it's a time and it, there, there has been a movement where women just, we're, we're here, we're, we need to be heard. And so we need to be very vocal about what we're doing. Thank you so much, Vicki. And Rebecca, if you could just uh, take us home, women's empowerment, empowerment in the community. Um, what are some things that, uh, that Habitat's doing? How can we empower others? Um, talk to us a little bit about empowerment, community empowerment. Yeah, I, I would say the engine that runs Habitat is volunteers. It's what we're built on, what we're based on. It's, it's reaching out and, and asking people who maybe haven't been asked in the past to do uh, construction or to paint something or to clean up a yard or, um, and what's really, uh, what's really driving us with, with COVID and the shutdown and the inability to utilize volunteers in the same way um, has had us rethinking how um, to make the same impact or increase impact with a different fuel. And what has worked this year is partnerships and developing partnerships, things that we didn't have time in the past for was to call the bank and find out if they care, you know? And this whole pandemic, I've been talking to more banks and more company owners and more people that are saying, hey, we, real, we realize we used to send a community group and they do a, a thing, but now we wanna have a deeper conversation about what investments we can make in order to look for solutions to the problem. And so thinking bigger and, and thinking through what we've done in the past, how do we, um, how do we do more? And, and the opportunity with COVID, our almost home program, which we provided childcare and meals and a central location had to pivot and go online. And last week, I think we, we had the largest class of graduates from almost home ever. And we were able to incorporate banking executives from some of our banking partners as volunteer coaches that live up and down the East Coast that aren't just located here in PA. Um, what we do for families and what we do for communities, our focus is on quality of life and the belief that everyone deserves a decent place to live. And my eyes are open today um, talking with Vicki and finding out, wait, we're building in Pottstown and I know that's accessible from the first floor, but it is a two-story house. Maybe I should have you know, maybe we're not where we should be. Do you know what I mean? And this is a, this is a great question um, and something that's gonna make us a better organization if, if we can incorporate universal design. You know, how do we do that? And it, it's a new, every conversation brings us around to realizing that there's more to learn, there's more work to do. And um, if we can reach out and say, how are you and mean it and have that be, um, uh, a genuine interchange. I think, I think that that we're doing, um, you know, as much as we we can in the moment to to remember and empower uh, each other as we move through this. 
Absolutely. So um, I want to thank you all. I think this was such a phenomenal conversation. Um, we just got so many different perspectives, so much rich information. Um, and I think that this is a springboard, springboard for additional conversations. So I wanna thank you all for your honesty, for your candor. Um, what I would love to do is open the, the floor up for questions. Um, you can either post your, your question in the chat or use the raise hand function. Um, and I will try to, to get to everyone. Um, but if you have any questions or comments, um, We'll just spend the last couple minutes uh, wrapping up and, and taking your questions for our panelists. I hear the clicking. It looks like we have a question from Ellen Schimberg and she was asking, um, can you tell me if it is more expensive to build an accessible home? So I'm sure that, that's for Vicki. That's a great question. It is not. Um, it's actually, uh, it actually is um, from what I understand and the, and the research that I've done it's actually um, cheaper to, to do it um, as the university design. Um, there's not all of the extras and um, other items that you do when you when you build something to look pretty. I mean, universal design is beautiful in itself, um, just to be by the fact that it is um, designed for everyone. You know, it's the greatest moment when, if you're showing an apartment or a house and, and you have somebody come in who is disabled and they can come in and they could actually see themselves living there it the the smile that you get on their face is absolutely not like something you'll ever see you know from somebody else because they've actually been able to get into that door to actually see something somewhere where they can actually see themselves living that to me is an amazing thing and that to me, um, you know, make that universal design makes that happen for, for more and more people every day. Yeah, and Vicki, I, I would also think that it's, you know, <laughs> probably better to use universal design because you don't have to go back and then re, you know, configure everything once it's already done. Just do it in the beginning. Yes. And, you know, and it, it's just, again, it just seems so simple. <laughs> Yeah, modifications are expensive unless you get somebody to help you. Um, people, people with disabilities are taking out these loans to try and modify their house so that they could live in it. They're also somebody, a senior who's now aging into disability, where we're going to see a huge bump in that in those numbers. I mean, our baby boomers are aging into disability more and more. Um, and I, uh, by 2026, it's supposed to be like an, a 30% raise in numbers, which I think is humongous, you know, but it is just, you know, it just needs to be that way. You know, our, our aging population is spending so much money to try and stay in their house. So they're not having to go into a facility, an institution because they can no longer they can no longer stay in their own house that they've lived in for most of their life you know and they can't move somewhere else because there's not enough housing yeah and i would i would tack on to that uh too is that a lot of these when you kind of go down to a, like a neighborhood or a block a lot of the seniors that are on that block have been anchors in that community for a very, very long time. And they're on a fixed income and then they now have a, a, a physical impairment. They can't get out and mow the grass. They can't get on the roof and remove the leaves. And so then the home repairs happen. So that we, we didn't do the basic home maintenance because we now have this physical issue and now we have a leaky roof and now the house is filled with mold and now uh, we need 
you know, it's just easier for us to go to an assisted living center. And then that house is flipped, not by somebody that is in that neighborhood or part of that community, but then sold to investors. And then you have a whole another issue. So um, we are we are committed to a, you know, helping people age in place because it preserves the fabric of that community and also that house that family has paid for. They've accumulated wealth in that house and, and that generational wealth passing on to their family is vital for generations to improve economically. Um, you know, uh, it, it's vital. Like that, that's how we, how we, we do better generation to generation. And so, um, you know, I think that, that all of these issues are so closely linked and you can draw a line. Here's what happens if we don't tackle the problem. And the problem can be as simple as modifying a house and making or building it correctly in the first place. So this house will now last for the next hundred years. And, and this is how we do it. So it's a very eye-opening. Thank you so much, Vicki. And I have just, Shaneria, it's like, this has been a great conversation for me and given me a good shot in the arm um, as you know we're facing um, what to do in the in the coming months at Habitat for sure. One of the that I just want to say really quickly is that one of the numbers that I found while I was trying to make sure that I could I had numbers is that um, more houses that are being sold that have accessibility features in them, okay. They're tearing those out <laughs> and, and, and making them normal um, when they when they put them back on the market instead of now thinking that it's it's actually a plus that you're selling a house that has accessibility features. I, I tell people all the time, I'm like, I I can't move into a house that is not accessible. Myself, I'm so blessed to be able to walk around. My friends who are wheelchair users, I can't move into a house that they can't come to. Right. You know, I mean, just the fact that they're tearing these things down, they're tearing these things out to make them look normal again so somebody will buy it um, is just mind blowing. Right. <laughs> Such a shame. And uh, I see a raised hand, um, Kim. Yes. Um, again, my my career was in architecture. I was a builder. I designed, and as a designer and builder who would actually design and lay out those plans that you all are talking about, quite often in our commercial side of the building, you know, you have certain requirements that would tell you so many spaces you have to make accessible, so many parking spaces you have to make accessible, but very rarely does that happen in residential because it's residential. A lot of things in the residential, you know, you're allowed to do just as general because of an assumption that everybody's going to be in that space. So even when you have, whether it's considered quote unquote your normal family, you can put in a spiral staircase and how dangerous is that? But you can put them in a house, but they do not build buildings or commercial things. So, okay, of that space, you have to have so many that are handicap accessible or other than the entrance itself. You have to be able to get in there and go upstairs, but they don't say the spaces have to be built accessible. You know, so you have all those low quarter counters that a bank will come up to that you can actually go up and pull up to a bank because it's commercial. But there's no thing that there's nothing that says, okay, we're going to have a development of homes. And of these homes, we're going to make 2%, you know, or 1%, 3, 10, or whatever the percentage may be of those homes that we're building in this new development will be handicap accessible. There's no law that requires that, you know, where it should be. You know, if you're going to have 10 houses, then why shouldn't three of them be handicap accessible or, you know, half of them or whatever percentage that may require, you know, and I find that now I'm disabled by law because of my spinal and my musculoskeletal. But in my house, my disability is different than somebody else's. My problem is I can't bend over a lot. So I need everything raised and I'm tall. So when I bought this house here as a, my retirement home, I moved in from a three-story, seven-bedroom to a ranch style. But I still had to change my kitchen because I can't bend over a lot. So I have to raise up my oven. I have to 
put my microwave everything in places where I don't have to, you know, bend over a lot, you know, even when I'm thinking about my refrigerator. And we don't get, there's no money set aside for that. You can't get a, renov a renovation loan for that you know, or any of those things that a disabled may be, you know, may require, you know, and as a woman, I think it, it just, it causes even more issues. And it's been so hard for me to actually renovate my house or those things that are accessible for me and, you know, the basic layout as opposed to the access to the home. Access is always given, but function within the space is not. And that, that where the problem lies. That's a very important point. Yes, absolutely. And then finally, how do, um, I guess, universal design homes differ from regular homes? I can tell you that universal, uh, universal home or universal designed home it is is no different. Um, it, 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 they look the same. People don't notice the differences. Uh, the people who notice the differences are the ones that are now being able to go into that home and actually see themselves living there. Um, but there is no difference. The you know the the very few. I always tell people there's ADA compliant. You know that from the ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act, there are certain that was done 30 years ago. <laughs> so that need, there's some upgrades that that needs to be made. Um, <laughs> but also those are bare bone. Like that is just compliance. That doesn't, that's not, to me that that's not being a human being by just towing the, the bottom line. So by doing these things in a, in a universal design way, you're, you're actually, um, designing for 100% of the population. Thank you so much. And it appears that we are a little over time. So I want to thank our distinguished panelists again for sharing their thoughts and their information. I'd like to, to thank um, particularly Rebecca and Habitat for hosting this event. Um, please go to Habitat's website and learn more about their women's build week um, as we celebrate this Women's History Month and International um, Women's Day. We hope you enjoyed the panel. It will be posted later uh, so that you can view it again. Um, and we look forward to our next conversation. Thank you so much for spending our lunch, your lunch hour with us. Um, it looks like people are putting their emails in the chat if you would like to follow up. Um, but otherwise, have a great afternoon. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.